Uh, welcome back uh, dear friends uh, today we are going to see about gamma ray spectrometer gamma ray spectrometer okay so in the previous uh, sessions we have seen about the different types of uh, gas filled detectors and the solid state detectors okay and extension of this is gamma ray spectrometer okay we all know that gamma rays are the rays that uh, has the highest penetration power which has the highest penetration power okay because it has the shortest wavelength it has the shortest wavelength whenever we tell about gamma rays you immediately remember the very popular hollywood movie hulk okay so you know how, how about this hulk okay so it's basically con connected with this gamma ray because uh, in that movie it says that is exposed to a sudden gamma rays that be it be genetically transformed into a very big person okay so uh, that actually tells you about the mightiness of this gamma rays so if you see the electromagnetic spectrum it falls on the far end which is the high energy and the low wavelength that is our gamma rays so typically energy is in the order of 10 million electron volt okay starting from few kilo, kilo electron volt to uh, several million electron volts you have gamma rays that is a very high energy radiation okay so there is no strict boundary between x-ray and the gamma ray the boundary is uh, slightly blurred okay that is uh, how your gamma rays come okay now what is the importance of this gamma rays so particularly this gamma rays are used for uh, uh, the naturally occurring gamma rays from space studies okay space studies which is used to identify the composition of a particular planet or a particular uh, place where we are exploring okay so most commonly these gamma ray spectrometers are employed for space applications similarly I will typically show you where out the typical gamma ray spectrometer that is used in the Mars rover that is used for exploration of the Mars surface okay so now uh, we will first see about how this gamma rays interact how gamma rays interact with uh, matter how the gamma rays interact with matter okay so first we'll see how this gamma ray interact we know that the gamma photon is a very very high energy photon okay the gamma photon is a very very high energy photon when this uh, interacts with matter what i mean by matter is an atom and particularly we are concerned about in an atom we know that in our atom we have a uh, central nucleus which is governed by uh, parts we have electrons okay we have electrons now the interaction of gamma with our matter is uh, connected with three particular phenomenon it is connected with three phenomenon three possibilities even we can tell it as three possibilities the first possibility is photoelectric effect photoelectric effect what is photoelectric effect basically we know that photoelectric effect whenever um, particularly if you uh, connect it with this particular thing so when a gamma photon okay uh, strikes an electron because of the very high energy because of the very high energy it can dislodge an electron from the innermost bound electron okay it can dislodge an electron from the innermost orbit okay so it can dislodge and this electron will come out this electron will be ejected out the electron will be ejected out with the energy of the gamma photon okay when the gamma photon strikes an atom okay the bound electron the bound electron the electron which is in the innermost orbit okay which requires very high energy to break it because of the very high energy offered by gamma rays it can eject out this electron okay this particular effect is called as photoelectric effect okay it absorbs the energy and the electron ejects out that's a photoelectric effect this is the most prominent effect in our gamma ray interaction 
apart from that you have two more interactions two possibilities second one is called as crompton scattering crompton scattering so what happens in a crompton scattering is that this will touch upon the free electron this will touch upon the free electron free electron so the gamma ray photon of energy is not going to dislodge electron but rather it is going to disturb the electron cloud it is going to disturb the it is just going to uh, eat and run it's like eat and run the gamma photon will eat and run so it is just getting scattered so what happens is that the electron cloud the cloud gets disturbed because of that the electron emits an energy okay so here not the entire energy of your gamma photon is transferred to the electron only a very very uh, so it may even range from a few electron volt to hundreds of electron volts okay so the energy observed in your compared to the energy observed in your photoelectric effect this energy will be very less okay this is mainly because it can scatter in many ways okay so based upon the scattering the energy that is observed okay it will be very very less okay so uh, this is second effect second effect is crompton scattering here a very fraction a fraction of the original energy is been uh, given to the electron thereby the electron moves particularly here uh, we are connected with the free electron but in your photoelectric effect it is connected with your electron which is in the innermost orbit and the third effect that is connected with your gamma ray is that it is called as uh, elect positron hole production positron electron electron pair production pair production okay so this particular thing how it happens is that the interaction is basically with the nucleus the interaction is basically with the nucleus okay when this high energy gamma rays um, interact with your nucleus it splits up into in, into uh, electron and positron okay so it actually produces pair okay this positron may again annihilate another electron okay and it moves on it it produces a reaction okay so here the gamma ray is mainly responsible for production of positron electron pair okay it unstabilizes the nucleus it unstabilizes the nucleus okay so these are the three possibilities when a gamma ray interact with matter either it can dislodge a electron from the innermost orbit that is the photoelectric effect or it can give a part of the energy to the free electron that is crompton scattering or it can dislodge or make unstabilize your nucleus by pair production this is the third possibility effect that is connected with your gamma ray interaction okay but for our gamma ray spectrometry the most favorable effect is the photoelectric effect okay the most favorable is the photoelectric effect again this depends upon the different types of detector in some detectors the photoelectric effect and pair productions are more dominant for example germanium detectors if suppose if you have scintillation detector the crompton scattering is more dominant so depending upon the type of thing you will get different signals okay fine so where these types of uh, gamma rays actually occurs as i told these gamma rays are used in space studies okay particularly uh, in the martian soil when these gamma rays interact with the soil when the gamma rays interact with the soil they emit neutrons okay because of the very high energy that they interact with the nuclei that interact produces neutrons it uh, moves takes out the neutrons it takes out the neutrons these neutrons further because of these these are very high energy neutrons these collide with other atoms these collide with higher other atoms okay which actually produce uh, radiations radioactive radiations it produces radioactive radiations okay 
so here actually uh, instead of this not basically gamma rays this is basically cosmic rays we know that cosmic rays are the i penetrating rays okay so that is available in the cosmos the space when this interacts with the soil because it is very very i penetrating uh, we are actually discussing how gamma rays is produced in the space how gamma rays are produced in the space these cosmic rays when they interact with our martian soil they actually dislodge the neutrons they dislodge the neutrons from the substance which the excited neutrons the excited neutrons interact with some atoms and molecules in the vicinity when these atoms and molecules absorb the energy that are given by these neutrons they move from the ground state to an excited state okay these excited species come back to the normal giving away the extra energy this extra energy is in the form of radioactive which is normally a gamma ray okay so if you capture this gamma ray and we analyze it using a spectrometer a particular kind of spectrometer that we are going to use it is called as gamma ray spectrometer if we analyze the gamma ray spectrometer we'll be able to understand the type of nuclei that has emitted this particular type of gamma radiation we'll be able to identify which is the nuclei that is responsible for the gamma radiation okay once you understand what is this nuclei you can identify what is the type of element that is present in the martian soil or the atmosphere okay so to understand about the different constituents that are present in the martian soil we can use gamma ray spectrometer okay so that's where your gamma ray spectrometer comes into picture okay so basically if you take your gamma ray spectrometer the important part of your gamma ray spectrometer okay so this is your complete block diagram of your gamma ray spectrometer okay your gamma ray spectrometer so previously we have seen about um, how the gamma ray interact with the matter then we have seen uh, why this gamma rays are very much important for space studies okay and now we'll see the block diagram of a gamma ray spectrometer okay so the block diagram of a gamma ray spectrometer in includes a high voltage bias supply is the first part it uses high voltage bias supply which necessarily powers the entire part whatever the analyzer or the detector everything is being powered by your high voltage uh, bias supply then you have the actual detector this is your detector this is your detector so here it is actually shown as a scintillation counter either it detector again we have seen two types of detectors either uh, they employ um, scintillation counter scintillation counter that is nothing but sodium iodide scintillation counter that is nothing but sodium diodide or it can be a semiconductor detector a semiconductor detector which is high purity germanium indicator high purity germanium indicator or it can be a, a lithium drifted uh, silicon lithium drifted germanium it can be a lithium lithium drifted lithium drifted germanium most commonly high purity germanium indicator is used okay this is the type of semiconductor detector that is employed for gamma ray spectroscopy then finally with the detector you go to the multi channel analyzer which is going to analyze the signal it is going to do a very important process called as pulse height analysis it is going to separate different pulses already i told you in our basic detector your energy your energy of your incoming radiation okay is going to be reflected in the pulse height okay the pulse height is going to reflect the amplitude is going to reflect the energy of the incoming signal when we told about the basic nature of the detector basic quality of the detector we i told you that the energy should be proportional to the output pulse height or the pulse height or the amplitude depends upon the energy of the incoming radiation okay so we require a pulse height analyzer 
to separate different signals according to the height so multi channel analyzer finally it is given given to your uh, computer for analysis okay now first the detector part already we have seen the detector here i am going to show you the schematic of a, uh, a semiconductor detector okay a semiconductor detector already we have discussed in the previous video radiation measurement part 2 if you have not seen you can just i will give the video in the description link you can see the radiation measurement part 2 where i have explained the working of a semiconductor detector this is the actual uh, diagram of your high purity germanium uh, or uh, lithium drifted germanium detector okay you can see this already we have seen the working of these types of detector so basically it is kept in liquid nitrogen what is the purpose of liquid nitrogen the purpose of the liquid nitrogen here is it should uh, it should not have any output the germanium detector should not have any reverse bias current in the absence of radiation in the absence of radiation for that purpose only we have this liquid nitrogen cooling okay which will ensure that there is no current or any current when there is absence of radiation only when the radiation is present it is going to give you an output okay so this the working you can refer to the previous video here we are actually showing you the actual circuit how our semiconductor detector looks like okay so so next uh, when you see the detector okay so here uh, we'll see the uh, here we have actually seen the total block diagram so this uh, already we have explained about the detector this part alone we'll see in detail this part alone we'll see in detail this is called as multi channel analyzer multi channel analyzer multi channel analyzer okay this is called as multi channel analyzer okay so it has different parts so we can divide this into broadly two areas one is the first one we already seen this is the detector it can be either a germanium uh, lithium drifted or that is a high purity germanium this is a semiconductor detector or a scintillation that is sodium iodide okay then followed by your detector you have a preamplifier you have a preamplifier which is going to do the initial amplification and converting your current pulse into an voltage pulse then you have the main amplifier which is going to do a basic uh, differentiation of the signal and amplifying the signal followed by that you have the multi channel analysis pulse site analysis you have the pulse site analysis which where uh, nothing pulse site analysis not very dif difficult one basically you are trying to sort the pulses we are trying to sort the pulse okay that is what a pulse site analyzer so you have analog to digital converter you have a computer interface con content which is going to do the pulse site analysis okay for all these units you require a power unit of high voltage bias supply we have a power unit high voltage bias supply okay so uh, coming to the detector coming to the detector so what are the factors important for selecting the detector first important factor is the resolution okay the first important factor is the resolution of the detector okay so the resolution will be helpful to detect uh, different signals that is the first important factor that is uh, required okay also the detector choice is preferred by the complexity of the spectrum complexity of spectrum okay so more complex the spectrum more high resolution is required for example plutonium has a much more complex gamma ray spectrum than uranium plutonium has a more complex spectrum than uranium so complexity of the spectrum will also decide the choosing of the detector and the third factor that is responsible is called as efficiency okay efficiency is another parameter for the choice of the detector okay the efficiency actually determines the count rate count rate okay that can be expected that is the time that is required to achieve a given precision 
a given precision and sensitivity okay what is the count rate that is a very important part these are the parameters to be considered when you are choosing your detector okay so the second factor is uh, we'll see about the bias supply bias supply what are the typical power requirements power requirements for different units okay basically the high voltage bias supply it is providing the electric field okay it provides electric field that collects the charge generated by the gamma ray interaction okay it provides the electric field it provides the electric field that collects the charge that collects the charge generated by uh, gamma ray interaction gamma ray interaction okay it it collects the charge that's the basic purpose and it also powers the different units okay it powers the different units typically if you see uh, the germanium detectors the germanium detectors require very low current very low current in the order of say 10 power minus 9 amperes okay typical requirement for your germanium detectors okay and the voltage requirement for is order of few hundred volts it's order of few hundred volts 2000 volts 100 to 1000 volts okay the voltage requirement is the current and voltage requirements okay and uh, typical bias supply typical values will be 5 kilo volt and 100 micro amperes is the typical requirement for germanium detectors okay and the bias requ required for scintillation scintillation detector will be in the order of uh, one uh, this is for germanium for uh, sodium iodide that is our scintillation counters it will be in the order of few thousand volts few thousand volts and the current is usually in the range of 1 to 10 milliampere the current is in the order of 1 to 10 milliampere okay so normally these supplies these power supplies come as a integrated module this comes as a integrated module they call it as nuclear instrumentation module nuclear instrumentation module okay it is called as nim popularly called as n i m nuclear instrumentation module okay so the naya nim we call it as nim which plugs into a frame or a bin that supplies the necessary voltages to power the module okay so nim bias supply frequently use an electronic switching device to generate the required voltage it uses a switching device okay but there is also a problem with the switching device the switching device also generates high frequency noise okay that can find the way into the pre amplifier and it may also cause significant degradation of the spectral quality okay but we have a solution for this the problem can be minimized by careful grounding and cable positioning okay so this is called nuclear instrumentation modules okay so next uh, first we have seen about uh, detector then we have seen about the bias supply the third we are going to see about the pre amplifier okay so as i told earlier the pre amplifier serves the purpose of okay converting the low amplitude short duration pulse okay from your detector uh, typical output from your detector will be say 10 millivolt and uh, 200 nanoseconds long pulse okay this has to be converted particularly pre amplifier converts the current pulse into an voltage pulse voltage pulse okay so that's the main purpose and normally the to maximize the signal to noise ratio output pulse and preserve the gamma ray energy information the pre amplifier must be very close to the detector pre amplifier must be very close to the detector okay so that is to reduce the uh, noise thereby to amplify the signal to or to increase the signal to noise ratio okay that's the requirement of pre amplifier 
and most probably your preamplifier will be a low noise fit low noise fit fit amplifier is the most preferred choice okay this uh, first amplifying stage okay so preamplifiers are either uh, room uh, are either in room temperature or cooled fets okay so they are the most preferred choice for your preamplifier is a uh, field effect transistor so output of your preamplifier is fed to your main amplifier it is fed to your main amplifier so the gamma rays pulse are amplified and shaped to meet the requirement of pulse height analysis okay so this is this uh, amplifies this again amplifies the preamplified signal and also it does some operation to shape the pulse it also does an operation to shape the pulse okay so what i essentially mean by shaping is okay so the shaping is achieved the shaping is achieved by means of differentiation and integration so differentiation and integration okay so qualitatively differentiation removes low frequencies and integration removes high frequencies okay so when both differentiation and integration are used the low frequency and high frequency components are strongly suppressed and relatively a narrow band of middle frequencies passed and amplified a narrow band of middle frequencies are uh, passed and amplified okay that is the purpose of this particular amplifier okay so the last part of your uh, analysis is the pulse height analysis okay so the pulse height analysis this is the integral part which is done with the help of a computer okay basically the pulse height analysis okay works in a differential mode that is used to uh, identify the pulse height okay so we basically need to distinguish one radiation from the another we have to distinguish one radiation from the other by means of a proportionality between the radiation energy and pulse size by means of a proportionality between the radiation energy and the pulse size we need to differentiate okay it is used to generate a detailed spectrum and thus to resolve a complex mixture of h rays and gamma rays okay a single channel pulse height analyzer basically it is a gate it is a gate typically say some point to 1 volt wide and which only accepts a pulse between a upper threshold level and a lower threshold level it's like a bandpass filter you can typically think of it as a bandpass filter okay so it has a upper discriminator level can you remember any circuit which works in this way which has a upper threshold and a lower threshold if you correct you have schmidt trigger okay schmidt trigger which has uh, which works between upper threshold and uh, similar to your uh, schmidt trigger here we have so you have upper threshold and a lower threshold which integrately used to identify your pulse height okay which only accepts a pulse between a preset so you have a here you see this is a very high pulse and this is so the pulse uh, uh, suppose we want to pass only the two okay so your upper level discriminator will eliminate all the pulses above the higher level threshold your lower will remove all the lower pulses which are all very small okay we want only the pulses in the second okay so whichever it's accept pulses between the upper and lower limits fine so if the voltage of the amplifier exceeds the discriminator threshold the discriminator emits a logic pulse the logic pulse are then counted this is counted by using a suitable counter okay so this will tell you about what are the uh, counts all the gamma rays that exceeds the desired threshold it will count all the gamma rays that exceeds the desired threshold that way we will be able to measure those signals okay typically your multi channel analyzer typically your multi channel analyzer this is a multi channel analyzer okay so it will be able to have uh, when i mean by multi channel is 512 to 1024 channels 
okay 512 to 1024 channels okay so we have uh, different peaks that are being recorded at uh, different peaks that are being recorded okay so that's how your uh, pulse site analysis pulse site analysis is basically a band uh, filtering it is a band filtering that's it okay so the last part of our gamma ray spectrometer a typical gamma ray spectrometer is shown here grs they call it as grs which a gamma ray spectrometer which was part of the mars rover which is a part of the mars rover which was employed for uh, identifying um, what is the characteristic of different composition that are present in the mars okay so that's what we have seen so that's the working of a gamma ray spectrometer essentially a gamma ray spectrometer is uh, having two main parts one is the detector okay the detector is followed by the multi channel analyzer which essentially classifies the different pulse sites why we are bothered about the pulse site because pulse site is going to tell the energy of the radiation pulse site is going to give you the information about the energy of the radiation the energy of the radiation is going to identify that particular nucleus which emitted that particular radiation thereby you will be able to analyze different substances that emit gamma rays okay so as i told this gamma ray spectrometer find extensive application in space applications and apart from that it also has a variety of applications for environmental degradation food monitoring you also use gamma ray spectrometers okay thank you friends thank you very much